to win. I mean, there is no two ways about it. <laughs> well, Jerry is a very honest, hardworking, and dedicated man. He cares for the downtrodden. I voted for Jerry Kufo for president of Ghana. He can root this nation when they are suffering through by the youth of the I, John Ajekum Kufour, having been elected, having been elected to the high office of the President of the Republic of Ghana, to the high office of the President of the Republic of Ghana. John Ajakumukufo was born on December 8, 1938, in Kumase, Ghana. He was born the seventh of ten children to Nana Kwejo Ajakum, head of the Oyoko royal family, and Nana Amadapa, a queen mother. His family has royal Asante lineage. He's from a middle class, well, not even a middle class, but in terms of uh, the the social structure in Kumasi from an upper class family with uncles and aunties, with grandmothers who were very well known and who had cultivated the habit of um, ingratiating themselves in, 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 the, in the Kumasi sociology of things. And they had everything to, to, to back that. The history favored them. from childhood days. His late uncle, called Nana Pejahine, was a close friend to my father, opening Kwabra Puku, also known as Kejetia Puku. They also had intimate relationship with the Otunfo then, by name, Sir Osage by Prem Pedi II. So this was three people who were related. Apejefie is very close to where I lived. This is stone true. So children from that house will go there and they will come there and we're playing together. The bond of friendship grew even stronger when both of them entered one of Ghana's finest secondary schools. Prempe College in 1959. At school, Kofo was good at both academics and sports. I found him to be very a brilliant art scholar and also a person born with innate wisdom. He also, for one reason or another, joined the cadet corps and rose through the ranks to become the commanding officer. Maybe he was learning skills for, lead, for leadership in future. Kofor went on to study law at Lincoln's Inn in London, England. He passed his bar exam in 1961 and went on to Exeter College at Oxford University to pursue legal studies. While he was studying at Oxford, Kofo received a call from his childhood friend, which set a new path for his life. I have always called 
Teresa, the first lady, Sister Teresa or Sister Abba. We first met in London. I told Abba that a good friend of mine, gentleman, is coming to Oxford. Her smile indicated that she liked the idea. That was the first thing. Second thing, I mentioned to Kofi that, hey, this beautiful dame will be coming to Oxford. It's there already. Kwame, thank you. <laughs> I don't know why he thanked me. So, according to Kufo, at the first union dance, she saw Sister Abba standing alone in a corner. Kofi said he was dancing, but he abandoned, abandoned his partner and went straight to ask Abba for dance. Kofo and Theresa became great friends. Their love relationship became stronger. Their romance was very fast. One day I went to Manchester University, Kofi went to Oxford. So he rang me to say, Kwame, we are going to have a wedding very soon. Can you be my best man? I said, Kofi, that job is not for me. And they married and having children in UK. Theresa and Kofo have five children together. In 1965, Kofo's mother convinced him to bring his family, at the time his wife and two children, back to Ghana. One day I had a call from him that Kwame, this was I think in the sixties when life in Ghana was rough. Kofi, I was shocked. Kwame, I'm going to Ghana. I said, Kofi, at this point in time, say yes. Even if possible, I'll, I know Kofi comes from Domo, uh, Buzia tradition, whatever you call it. It was I joined CPP and changed the party's policy from within. I said, good luck. I'm not going to Ghana until Nkrumah's regime is changed. I will not come to Ghana. My parents, after living overseas for a little while, brought us back to Kumasi where they started out. That's where they grew up. And... Um, my father was then the city mayor uh, till 1969 when we were about six or seven and we moved away to Accra for the first time. You know, my, my father had, was already in politics, but if you like, for the first time he was in uh, the parliament. Chief Kofo was about 70 years at the time. His father was made the Deputy Foreign Minister under Victor Uzu, one of the men who mentored President Kofo in a lot of ways. His mentors spotted him and began to groom him. I mean, I would say that by the time he was probably about 20, uh, Professor Buzia had already begun to exert an influence on his life. Um, asking him pertinent questions about what he wanted to do with himself, giving him advice, directing him as to what he should do. Um, bringing him through, if you like, his regime, you know, men being mentored or working in Victor Osu's chambers, being a deputy to Victor, being a deputy to Pauli. And then even when they went in power in the parliament of uh, 79, being put on the leadership track in parliament. And, you know, there were issues about his leadership. I would say that Victor trained me in so many other things. And at, point, at a point in time, he asked that 
whatever I do, I should do it for Mr. J. Kufor. And that's way back. Um, I would say from 1980s. So I went to him and uh, we started doing what he had to do. Indeed, what I can even say was that every Friday he used to come to Kumasi. So every Friday, if you had been at the Apejefi, you would see Mr. Kufo and myself around the gates of uh, Apejefi and we would discuss a lot of things. But I will say that we discussed the whole world. The government is a military government which will rule with advice from certain eminent civilians in the country. Kofor was arrested and detained twice in 1972 and after the 82 coup. He later met and renewed his friendship with Kojo Ochre in Pieni, one of his schoolmates from Prempe College. He was a year ahead of me. He left after the fifth form, went out to study. We knew ourselves, but we were not very, very close, you know. Uh, we became very close in the 1970s when I decided to go into politics. He has been in politics before. I used to go to him, chat with him about things which were going on. And he had become a, a deputy foreign minister. So we became closer at that time. Unfortunately, there was that coup of uh, uh, the 13th January man coup. Uh, they were put in prison. When he came out, that was when I have also decided to go into active politics. So we became close, we used to go to him. Then we found ourselves in parliament in 1979. We knew ourselves very close. Unfortunately, there's another coup. And in parliament, we were very young, even though uh, he was also a young man, but he had an experience before. Kofor has lost a few elections in his political career, but he's won many. And even at this age, that's how he has always been. And so to me, how he, he used to maybe get to people, get around to people and see how people are, uh, it's part of him. And so he's lost. The next thing is he should win. But finally, won in 1996 and 1998. I'm the flag bearer of the major opposition party in Ghana. At the time, Kofor had so many friends and supporters and a few committed enemies. Within the party, not everybody supported him. Even when he won the primaries, there were some who went to leaders like the late B.J. Darocha and our then uh, Chairman, Mr. Odoy Sykes, asking them to convince him to step down because they, they thought he wasn't the right person <laughs> to be elected after an election, to be elected the leader of the party to go and fight elections. He was never angry about these things when they came to him. He just said, let's leave them. They will come to realize that we are better than them. We got to a stage at one time, we had a fundraising event at the Golden Tulip then. And then somebody started this question of not having money. There you could see that he was a little angry. So he got to them, he looked at them and said, money or no money, we are going to win the election. If you want to go with us, go with us. If you don't want to go, leave it. Here was a man. You know, his leadership, superb. I understand uh, Dr. Rakun Brubi said something like that. The difference between MPP and NDC is Kufo. <laughs> and people were saying, <laughs> and when, the people, when people came to me, oh, this is Rakun, I said, that, but that is true. I, I John Ajekum Kufo, 
and Kofu One. It was considered by many to be a turning point in Ghana's future. After such an extended period of rule by one person, many were nervous about how the turnover of power would go. But the change went smoothly. We on our part wish you well. We on our part are ever prepared to assist you in government. We on our part are prepared to put our experience at your disposal. And we all pray that the good Lord himself will help you in this task of nation building. Once again, congratulations to you. Congratulations to everyone. Mr. Jake Wolfwar, the President-elect, let me take this opportunity on behalf of my colleagues and the nation to congratulate you and members of your team for the victory to form the new government that would lead us into uh, the next uh, four years. Should it turn out well, there's no doubt in my mind that Ghanaians will have been another period for four years. That's, I'd like to welcome you to this castle and the problems that come with this castle. <laughs> Even before the swearing in, I remember we had a discussion and he, he basically said, well, uh, he had decided that he was going to be open and uh, he was praying for Solomon's wisdom. So that, that's what he said to me. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, we were having a discussion in his room and, um, you know, he prepared himself. Mentally, he was, um, if you like, spot on. Around the time he run, won the presidency, we were all very tense, you know, uh, almost, if you like, unsure. But he, he was so calm. It was like he had, over the six or so years, which were various campaigns culminating in the presidency, or the winning of the presidency, he, I think he had come through. But it, he, like I'm saying, you know, his life was layer after layer of preparation. What is your government doing about JJ, about the remarks that he has been making? The people of Ghana reacted. And they reacted very, very effectively through the FM radio, through newspapers, and many uh, diverse ways. It was God's way to have brought somebody like President Kufour to take over from the man. Because his ability to handle the situation his ability to manage that transition. If you get into details, you'll be amazed. See, there was a time, I understand, he banned his predecessor from accessing the military camp. And some people did not understand. But here is a man who twice attempted and succeeded at least once in overthrowing governments. And I don't need to go into details about that. And after leaving office, was not comporting himself as a statesman, but continuing, he continued rattling all kinds of depletives, raining them on his successor and other people. And you would think it would have been proper to have allowed him to continue to relate to places where he could easily, because when he left, his own networks were still in place. The armed forces remained the same, except the command structure that I believe were uh, structures that were replaced by the same people. 64th Battalion was still actively a uh, part of the, of the armed forces. So it required real tact, finesse, and diplo diplomacy, so to speak, to have managed that. And for me, that's perhaps the most admirable thing about the man, you see. And this is not politics, this is common sense. 
because any other person could have goofed and we could have had a, a serious uh, uh, exactly, you know. So I did, he did it very well. And the eight years that he stayed on, he succeeded in containing the situation. And before he left, I'm sure he had correctly repositioned the security agencies to ensure that, in fact, we were truly in a democratic system. And we needed to build upon that. And I'm sure we've been building upon that. So those critical years, the uh, a few years, three, four years following the transition, could have been very uh, serious if the management then wasn't as uh, apt as it was under President Kofor. Kofor started the process of forming his government with some shocking appointments to his cabinet and other ministerial positions. When we were even bringing in some of the non uh, NPP people within our party, some of them stood against it. How can we bring these people? How can we bring Kwesindom and others? He said that's the way to build the country. They also have ideas, so let's bring all of them. Some of my friends, some of my colleagues who were left out initially and whatnot, were angry, came and said, but this is an appeasement. How can you do this? So he called all of us together over some beer. I said, look, I know this party. This is my party. I've been in this party for a long time. I know what destroyed this party in uh, uh, Joseph's time. I just, I just got up straight to his house. Oh, dog, you've come. Yes. Let's go and sit down. I said no. Why? I said, why have you been doing all this? Everybody in Kumasi is not happy. So why are you doing that? Indeed, for about 45 minutes. We, we were up, uh, you know, before you get to the inner chamber. That's where we were. And I, for 45 minutes, I just, I just thought I had to lambast him even. And this is the president of the Republic of Ghana. But I thought I had to. Because the people who felt they had done everything for him thought what he was doing was not the best. <laughs> and I was the one to carry the message. And to carry the message, it was not the best, but I had to. So after the 45 minutes, he said, Doc, have you finished that? So we have to put the party together. And the only way to put the party together is to do what I have to do. So it's not as if maybe I do not know or I do not understand what's happening. But the most important thing for me as the president of the republic coming from the NPP is to ensure that this party is put together. And that is what I am doing. So he said, assuming Nanel uh, uh, is put into the cabinet, though what it means is that everybody who, who is under Nanel Kufado will know that they are part of the of the party. If Hackman is put in, everybody who is under Hackman will come in. And from that day on, I found the need to even over respect him. We have had a whole lot of witnesses from all walks of life. In 2002, Kofo set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to examine abuses of power occurring under the five governments that had ruled Ghana since 1966. Ghana's economy was really struggling at the time. So Kofo announced the highly indebted poor country initiative. The first one, the hippie initiative. It uh, was hot debate in the country. The clergymen will say, how do you say we are poor? This, if you say we are poor, we will become poor. The top economist, no way. His own cabinet, no way. Makofi said, this is the way we are, we are going. A good leader sometimes has to be autocratic. This is the way we are going. And he took the hippie initiative. 
and you all know the results. Plenty of money to build schools, universities, polytechnics, roads. In every small village you see a sign, Hepic Fund, if you remember. Fantastic, bold decision. We have the huge problem of uh, a dislocated economy to work on. The country was bankrupt. Worse than it is, uh, perhaps today people think we were bankrupt in 26 no whatever. The country was bankrupt. That's what led to the declaration of the hippic status. You see? And even that hippic, some of his own ministers opposed it. But as courageous as he was, he announced it. Why do we go hippic? Some kind of pride. But the fact is that we were bankrupt. And nobody has asked why we were bankrupt. Because there was a leader then, isn't it? There was a leader for 19 years, who run this country down? Nobody ever raised that question. Because at that time, people were afraid, still people were even afraid to refer to the fact that those years made us bankrupt as a nation, you see. So being able to go hippic and rising from those ashes and building the economy, if you looked at all the economic indicators before he left office. I'm not an economist, but I have a I have the common sense to know that all the indicators were positive plus. We must create jobs for our people. We must make sure that things change and we are determined to change things. I told somebody, I took Ghana to HIPIC, I will take Ghana out of HIPIC. That's right. One of the most important steps he took uh, was that of HIPIC. And, uh, you know, those who were present when those decisions were made. I, I saw another side of it. But those who were present when those decisions were made in cabinet would tell you that almost nobody supported the decision. But I, I mean, at home, I, I saw him working the phones with powers that be. I, I saw him making commitments saying that if he could get X, Y, and Z, he would do this or the other. And it, it was clear he knew what he was doing. He had decided by then, and again, this is from discussions that I had with him, he decided by then that the country was broke, the system was broke, and if he didn't do this, then what was he going to do to succeed? And he was quite certain in his own mind that there was certain radical steps had to be taken or that his, that government of his was not going anywhere. So his point was, if, if you don't support me, then give me an alternative. When this, we have to go out of HIPIC, but there were some things we have to do. We don't have to increase salaries and what not. Yeah. The, the labor was fighting for TUC. everybody. If we do that, we couldn't get out of uh, Hepic. So what did it do? So invited leadership, TUC, NAT, other associations, to a conference, sat them down, talked and talked and talked. These are the realities. We can increase wages for you now. We are not saying that wages shouldn't be increased. But what we are saying, let's stop it now and do it later. If we want us to do it, the force us to do it, we may do that. But the, the outcome of that will be this, which will affect all of us. Mm. At the end of it, that, he came to say, Mr. President, we'll go with you. We were agreed, and we were able to come out of HIPIC earlier. Ghana had, at the end of HIPIC, Ghana was forgiven eight billion dollars in loan. And then there was a certain degree of austerity that you put in place, but the austerity was not as severe as the SAP in the 1980s. So you can say that, okay, then we move forward and spend the money by investment. We have to take advantage of AGOA, the Africa Growth Opportunities Act, and then you also have the Millennium Challenge uh, that came. By going HIPIC, he was able to embrace those particular policies, uh, which actually about $500 million 
that uh, the compact actually uh, in the first compact gave Ghana to do the George Bush Highway and then you do another one for agriculture and then you do one for electricity and so you are setting the course. As president, John Ejikum Kufo was phenomenal in every way. His impact straddled every aspect of national development. He abolished the criminal libel law and submitted to the African peer review mechanism and supported peacekeeping and reconciliation across Africa. Kofos Turner saw the introduction of the e-governance program, a review of the Procurement Act, and the introduction of transparency laws such as the Whistleblower Bill. He introduced the Domestic Violence Law during his tenure. He introduced the Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty Program, LEAP, to provide direct cash transfers to poor households. It was during his time as President of the Republic that Ghana discovered oil in commercial quantities. President Kufo launched the $50 million Microfinance and Small Loans Maslock Fund and the Health Insurance Scheme for All Ghanaians. In 2006, Ghana made a record high cocoa production of 700,000 tons from a low of 350,000 tons in 2001. President Kofor's government introduced a lot of social intervention programs like the Metro Mass Transport and the National Health Insurance Scheme, among others. These initiatives brought remarkable transformation in the socio-economic development of the country. Because if you knew the Cape Coast Road then, then you can appreciate that he did not build the road, but he really brought it up to a new level. <laughs> the Kumasi Road, up to a new level. On and on and on, you see. So I think in that respect, one can also look at the economy in the area of infrastructure. Uh, again, I was here when uh, a lot of uh, Ghanaians resident abroad started flocking into this country to open new businesses. He declared a golden, road, golden age of business, uh, where I don't know if he succeeded or not, but I, lo I know that a lot of business initiatives privately came under his uh, ten, ten years. You look around Ghana now, many of the social policy interventions came from him because he looked at this and said, look, this country, if we really want to move ahead, we should try as much as we bring everybody together. So people can't afford hospital fees. Well, what do we do? Let's institute something which will help, so we came with the National Health Insurance. They realized that the Catholics have started something in the north, I think upper west, yeah. of feeding some school children to enable them to stay in school. Because they're not even getting food. So why should you go hungry and sit in a classroom? You wouldn't hear anything the teacher says. So we studied that and said, this is something we should spread to the whole country. The other decision which I admire he took was the redomination of our currency. Fantastic policy. Just remove the zeros <laughs> and we were there. And people call it the new Ghana with small s, people call it Kufo dollar. I think people will not forget, those who would live in that era will never forget it. Plenty of money in our pocket. The dollar was then, I'm told, stronger than USA dollar. This is two decisions he, he took who benefited Ghana. So, our economy was moving. The nation was peaceful. But one fine afternoon, on 14th November 2007, the nation was stunned with the scary news of a man who crashed into President John Ejekum Kofor's vehicle at the Opebia House traffic light intersection in Accra. I remember the event of his accident, for instance. And it was, uh, it was a nasty shock. You know, the, the president uh, is traveling the convoy, his car is hit. This is a heavy bulletproof car, it's somersaults. 
and it's like you're thinking, wow, what's, what's going on here? You know, this is like a knockout punch. Um, but, you know, there were other issues. The crisis in, in the north, you know, the death of Diana. Uh, challenges from within the party. Disloyalty. Um, plots. But he, he was self-assured. He was self-assured. He had a certain confidence. He had um, purpose. And um, thank God we weathered most of the storms. And there were many of those storms during the eight years of President Kofor's government. So many scandals. And interestingly, many of them were discovered to be false. First one, oh, the president has impregnated this Yazi woman and he has twins and blah, blah. You remember that incident? People marched even to his house. Yazi, what became of that? Another scandal, oh, he bought a hotel for, for his son. The truth, his son secured the law. So if you want to say, you want to argue, well, maybe if the son wasn't a, a son of a president, he couldn't have gotten a loan. That's a fair argument to make. But to say that the, he got some money somewhere to buy, no, it was a, a bank loan. Everybody knows that now, 2.5 million or so. And now another scandal is what? Uh, what, corruption? Uh, I don't know, because as I saw sit here, if this man was corrupt, I would be swimming in money here. But I'm now sweating, trying to raise funds for the foundation. <laughs> His friend, Richard Anani, had to be investigated by Shraj over some allegations. Dr. Tanani has been reported to Shirag, I think, for uh, his corruption or something like that. He's been a very active member of the, a small group of people who push him on to become the president. And naturally, he was sad. Sad. But what he said that if this is the situation, now I remember he called Dr. Anani and said, I'm very sad about what is happening. But if it's this situation, and if confided with me that what is happening is not true, then I mean the best thing, you just resign. Go to Chicago or wherever, and let's find out. If they come out to say they haven't done anything, as we are being told, I'll be the happiest person. If it comes out that, what is, we are being told is true. I'll, I'll be sad to lose you, but I have to be honest, you have to go. So he's just encouraged him to go and face the, 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 the judicial process. Mm. Mm. Believing God has told him that there was no truth in what they were saying. Kofor had a dream that would outlive his eight-year tenure as president, an ambitious goal which would turn Ghana into a middle-income country. With this goal in mind and the realization of how difficult it would be, Kofor looked internationally for aid. In 2006, he appealed to South Korea for support in attracting private investments. He also met with U.S. President George W. Bush to discuss receiving aid from the Millennium Challenge account. He developed very, very close relations with significant external leaders, both in corporate uh, uh, world and also in the area uh, of the U.S., uh, especially George Bush. Uh, and as a result of that, that created the environment for him in his post-presidency to continue to be very active and then to reflect. But in all, I think it was a good time for him mm -hmm. and he should probably be, be happier. Not all of them, I mean, former presidents in Africa had it the way he's had it. The glory that uh, uh, came with his post-presidency, the international statesman that he became and still is, and the fact that he's still consulted around the world by many organizations, including uh, those who work or still working in water and sanitation, whether from the Imperial College in London or 
other places in Latin America. And he has his foundation to direct, not direct sort of uh, in literary terms, but at least to, for him to impact whatever is left of his politics, mm. his strategic thinking mm. and interest with this foundation. No president comes to office and is able to accomplish the vision with which he went into that office. So a foundation, again, is a way for you to continue in different ways the vision that you had for your country. So in this case, uh, President Kufo told me that in his uh, entire public life, uh, you know, the man entered public life when he was like 27, 28 years old. Uh, in all his life in the public sector, uh, he finds leadership, leadership to be the missing link in the development chain, you see, in Africa. So he wanted us to have this foundation to focus on preparing young people for leadership. We developed a program. We call it the Kufo Scholars Program. Uh, that combines academics with practical or what one may call experiential exposures. So um, we started four years ago. And uh, currently we maintain 60 students from 11 different universities in the country. It's a three year long program. We recruit students who have just completed their first year. Then we keep them for the next three years. Uh, then during the period we expose them to so many different activities. They start with a leadership camp. President Kofo became an iconic figure in Africa as a leader whose economic and educational policies led to significant positive changes in Ghana during the first decade of the new millennium. He traveled all over the world addressing world leaders, researchers and academics on building economic development and food security, especially in Africa. There was the World Food Program, which he was asked to, to, to be the chair and uh, so that was in Rome. So we were in Rome, but it also involved a lot of traveling. So we will travel to Liberia, we will travel to Kenya, we will travel to all sorts of places where there were issues to do with food security and where his expertise as a statesman, as a leader of a continent which had development problems and issues to, to confront with uh, where needed. So he was traveling around mm. and uh, there were one of the checks that he had to give. At one point it was continuous for a month. He had to travel to Cornell University to talk about the legacy of his national health insurance. So from Cornell it was to Japan, from Japan it was to Korea and then it was back to the US and then to London and then back to Accra. In all these places, the attraction, the park lecture rooms, the audience who were very inquisitive of development and democratic issues in Africa were fill these places. So it gave him that assurance, if he needed one, that indeed, at least he did something good in his eight mm. years uh, as president of this country. Another interesting venture President Kofo has invested in is the 200-acre cocoa farm in his hometown at Daba in the Achuma Inwabiaja constituency of the Ashanti region. Manager of the JA Kofo Farms, Mr. Apaujemfi, says it is not surprising that the former president, whose political career had taken him across the globe, has so much interest in farming. Mm. 
or ya no me a I was a poor brain. My friend said, Ye, ye, Juma. In the term be a wedgeman beano. Ye point ya, ye, ye, Juma, near chap. I was a poor man, no swagger. Said the old by our betu ye. Ye, ye, Jumaniano, the bell was a poor man, no one said time, see. The wedgeman, ye point, ye, ye, Juma. See the new walk, cry him. Because on one casano, or see cry any edition in school. Into one to two, cry him as a cry, to the piano, and you Ah. You see, I can your family cuckoo crack a sea pie, so sing her bed five. A wen in the sewer, and so yes, I take you contra, yea, yea. See, I'll be free, I'll be quen in the sewer. Yako, yea, yea. I'll present also about four hundred acres. These days, John Ajakumukofo is unable to visit Kumasi and his village of Daba as often as he used to. He spends most of his time. At his Accra residence, receiving courtesy calls and attending certain important national events. His nephew is Otunfos Apejahine, or Hineba Ousu Efriye IV, who has been inspired in many ways by the excellent leadership qualities of the former president. I believe he, he himself would admit that God has been good to him. He's, he's had a fulfilling life. I mean, Many, many people would wish to be in his shoes, so I, I doubt he has any major regrets. Um, from what we hear of his uh, childhood, uh, most people say he was born with a silver spoon, so to speak. But he did not let it get into his head. Uh, he's applied himself, there have been ups and downs with all this. His decision to venture into the field of politics, he spent Probably in total, maybe a year plus in jail because of coup d'etats. I'm sure it also made him tougher and, and probably helped him appreciate um, the nuances of life. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's had a, a great and fulfilling life. I mean, I mean, the whole family is proud of him, there's no doubt about that. And I think uh, history has been kind to him. He's been fortunate to, to still be alive and see um, a couple of presidents after him. And then some of his decisions, his policies bear fruit and, and people, people make references to how good those days were. I mean, what more could you wish for? To be alive and, and hear people speak so well of you. So, I mean, I believe... Uh, He's, he's, been, he's been very fortunate and the family is very, very proud of him. In his ancestry, and uh, so many of them before him have set standards, um, have done things, and it would seem that in their family they, they have the, the blessing or the good fortune of occasionally throwing up brilliant, powerful, purposeful public servants, businessmen, chiefs, and uh, he seems to have risen to the occasion. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll definitely sort of uh, thank him for that, for giving us that. And um, you know, living his life to the full. I think that's that is what he has given us: a sense of purpose, sense of direction. I'll say good value systems. And I hope that um, his impact in his immediate and extended family will carry through and influence. Uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, etc. He set an example for us. One thing Kufo once said, he didn't care too much for his life in serving the country. He gave his life to this country. So I told him, fine. For me, there's a limit I can give my life to this particular country. This show his selfless life. 
ready to die for his country. And do things right, put things right. Hmm? Is Ghana worth dying for? He says here. He showed that within a period of eight years, if you ha have the right policies, there could be very good social intervention measures which could give people the hope that things are possible, that things could be done. And it showed in some of the very good social intervention programs that came up, whether it's a LIP, whether it's a school feeding program, whether it's affordable housing that he started, or whether it's ensuring by, by and, and following the constitution that kids, all kids should have some basic yes. education. These were things that went very well. And many people still remember the eight years of his government with some of the, the effects of some of these on their families, mm. on the society as a whole. So um, this will be remembered. One of the thorniest problems of our economy is the unrealistic structure of pay and prices. He's a good man, kind-hearted man, uh, open-minded. He, 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 he first for human beings, as we say in Chi, or Tima, or Tima, he empathizes with people, you know. He's, he's a good human being, okay. let me put it that way. Simply that way, that he is a very good human being. I have met so many people. He's one of the, one of the good human beings I have met. Arguably, John Ejekumkofo is one of the most outstanding presidents Ghana has known. His legacy of greatness will live on, and his name etched in the history of our great nation forever. Mm -hmm.